your digressions. It's, I okay, so let's get started. So my name's Steve yeah. Mann, and I want to talk about the intersection of sustainability, technology, and society, the Sustainable Technology Society. So ordinarily, we have computer, human-computer interaction. We often talk about how computers interact with people, but it disconnects itself from the environment. So what we want to do is look at these three axes, the, the physical world of sustainability, earth, water, air, climate, the virtual world of AI, internet, and those sorts of things, and then the social world of governance, law, privacy, security, trust, all of those human institutions, as well as other beings um, beyond just the human race. And so at the intersection of these three axes, we have the concept of mercivity, which looks at a sort of where you take your normal human computer interaction and add a physical element to it. And so it's this physicality that I think makes the world quite interesting. And so we've got the environment, that which is around us, our surroundings, that's the sustainability. We've got the environment, which is us ourselves, and you're part of my environment and I'm part of your environment. And then we've got between the environment and the environment, between myself and what's around me, I've got my environment, which is my clothing, shoes, these eyeglasses, these headphones, and so on. And that's kind of often the technology. So technology often assumes the role of a container around us, smart vehicles, smart vessels, smart buildings, and things like that. And so what I want to talk about is where these things meet the physical world. And so we have the concept of, of computer programs when I was growing up, we now call it code, and sort of the freedom to understand that code, freedom to the source code, for example. And so these issues come home to roost, or come home to bear. Uh, in the physical world, uh, Richard, you and I certainly know about the freedom to look at code. And Kevin, in particular, brings the sensibility of agriculture and tractors and things like that and where, where the code meets the physical world. And that's really immersivity. When you take the world, uh, Richard, what you're doing and intersect that with the world of what Kevin's doing, you've got this immersivity or this confluence of the physical, virtual, and social, the environment, the environment, and the environment. So I guess one thing just in terms of the way that we're connecting here, I, I feel in many ways, at least myself, I'm using older technologies that I can understand because I tried to connect to HDMI and of course it didn't work. So then even though I'm the author of the content, I'm trying to unlock my own content, the copy protection, I've got to circumvent this copy protection technology to access my own content stuff that I, I own. And as as uh, Lewis Rossman would say, it's almost as if Sony broke into your house and stole your Blu-ray DVD when they deactivate something that you've already bought. You would buy something, buy content, and then the, the policies change and they say due to a policy change we're revoking your license to the content that you purchased and you won't be able to access it anymore. So the analogy he made is as if Sony broke into your house to steal your Blu-ray. I feel that the companies that designed HDMI, it's almost as if they broke into my house and stole, stole my family photo album or my own memories, my own content, things that I already own and produced myself and didn't even offer for sale. It's not even merchandise. It's just my own thing. So Richard. Well, I, every time the word quote, content, unquote, is used to refer to some set of works that humans have made, uh, cultural works, uh, software, whatever kind of works they are, it disparages them all. 
it says basically they are stuffed to fill up a box. And I don't want to think about any kind of works that way, whether they be uh, movies that we might watch or perhaps make, uh, programs that we might run or write, photos that we might look at or take. Uh, they're, they're, each of them is a work, a work made by some people that can be appreciated in some ways by people. And to refer to them as content is to take the attitude of a business tycoon who wants a box to be full of something and doesn't care what as long as it'll sell. Now, there are people who think that way. I don't want to be one of them. So I'm not going to train myself to adopt that attitude. And therefore, I have decided to absolutely reject the term, quote, content, unquote. Now, occasionally, I refer to myself as a malcontent provider because I'm starting to spread uh, discontent with the regime that tries to impose itself on us. But I will never refer to my writings or my software as, quote, content. And of course, you're free to say what you like, but I hope you'll take, I hope you'll agree with me. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll respond to that. Now I'm starting to agree with you that I don't like the word content because it sounds commercial. It's a commercialization. When I was growing up in the 1960s and 70s, we programmed computers and, and, and write programs. And, you know, at some point in time, the word software came up, where is an article or good of commerce? And I feel that the word software is a commodification of computer programs, commodification of code. Hardware, we go to the hardware store and buy nails. We used to buy them by the pound. You know, you go to the hardware store and buy screws, nails, nuts, bolts. And now we've tried to put computer programs in that same category as physical, as if they were physical merchandise, software package, software developer. So along a similar vein, I reject the word software as a commodification because not all computer programs are software. Some of them are given away free. Well, you know, in the 1970s at MIT, when most of the software we was using was in principle free software, although uh, there weren't any other computers most of it could run on, uh, we called the, we said they were programs, but we also called them software, and it had nothing to do with how they were distributed. It's just that they weren't the same thing as the physical hardware of that computer, some of which had also been built by the hackers of the lab. I have a quick question. Uh, it's inspiring to, to sit on here and listen to both you guys. We're running on systems today that guys like Richard Stallman envisioned clear back in the 70s, probably in the 80s. I, don't want to, I, I shouldn't say 70s, probably 80s. Yeah, 70s. The worst tractor that a, a, the corporate representative from John Deere will tell you that was ever built was a 1970 John Deere 4020 tractor. The best tractor that a farmer will tell you that was ever built was the 1970 4020 John Deere tractor. The, the divergence in, in lust for the equipment is control. Mm. That tractor simply runs forever, doesn't break down. The holy grail is to turn back against these corporations that took our rights away. The same technology and computer systems that they used. So in other words, if we can roboticize that steering wheel and that brake and that gear shift, there's three things. We basically made a drone out of that tractor and we made a robot. That is a holy grail. And that's why I'm on the link here, because you guys can actually see how those things can work from a control and from a computer standpoint. And guys like me don't have that background. Well, we, we can tell you what we need. Uh, and if we don't do this, if the price of food in the grocery store, you might have to have a membership card just to be able to buy a John Deere approved uh, loaf of bread. I mean, it's gonna be blockchain they're going to control it, and we need to unwind it. So I'm so inspired, and I'm just humbled to be here. I'm going to go back on mute. 
well, you know, I never heard that idea before, but I can, now that you've said it to me, I won't say it can't happen. I mean, it's, it's a lot like, it's, it's a further extrapolation in the same direction as other things we're seeing. And if monopoly concentration continues, it could easily get there. Now, uh, the Biden administration is fighting monopolies pretty damned hard. And uh, I was just watching a video about the FTC's lawsuit against Amazon for doing things somewhat like that, although, of course, the details are different. Uh, it was made by Robert Reich, and uh, it's worth finding and looking at not on YouTube directly, but through NVIDIA.us, which is a set of proxies so that uh, YouTube can't run its software on your computer. But in any case, uh, you know, that it's, the, it's not the same in details, but it's the same general idea, and it certainly results in extracting a lot of money from everybody except the monopolists. Yeah, what, 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 I, Kevin, I, I think what you said about older tractors being desired, and Richard, I see this in you as well, a, a tendency to use older technologies. Like for myself, I like these older oscilloscopes, you know, that, that tell me the truth. And we did an interesting experiment with rotor versus stator current. We had some brand new oscillos oscilloscopes. You take a $100,000 oscilloscope, modern connect it to rotor versus stator current for an XY plot, it looks like crap, you can't see much. You take an old Tektronix 1957 uh, Tek 515 and hook it up, XY, it's beautiful. It's updating 15 million times a second. It's like okay. millions of frames per second of you, not just 60 frames per second, because it's continuous direct to the plates of the cathode ray screen. And so the older technologies, we're often in love with and richard i see you're you're using an old phone very much like what they have in the amish communities when they use a phone it's often a rotary phone in the barn uh, they don't have a cell phone for example uh actually you're you're sort of semi right but i'd like to explain what i'm actually doing and why i use computerized technology, I'm perfectly happy to do so, when either the computers are running software that we, the users, control, free software, not proprietary software, then I know that they're, they're not programmed against us, or when it's something that can't talk to anybody else except me, and that means it can't be obeying orders to shaft me. Now, many products nowadays are designed so that they have to talk to the internet somehow in order for you to use them. And if they're talking to the internet, that means they're talking to the manufacturer or somebody in cahoots with the manufacturer, which can send them commands to do nasty things to you. And this is quite common. If you look at gnu.org slash malware, you'll find lists of some products which are tethered. They can't, you buy them, it's for use in your home or office, but you can't tell them what to do except going through the manufacturer's server. They won't work if they can't talk to the manufacturer's server. Of course, the manufacturer doesn't have your well-being at heart especially not once you paid for the product, and it will uh, program in malicious functionalities to, to squeeze money out of you is typically the ultimate goal, but the way they do that is by mistreating you directly. So I, I have a printer here, which was made by such a company, but it can't talk to the internet. It never has and never will. It can talk to my computer through a separate ethernet, which nothing else is on. And that way, I know that the manufacturer can't give it commands. There was even a computerized sex toy that was made to receive commands through the internet. Now, I could imagine that 
use of that might be enjoyable. But it subjects the owners, the nominal owner, to being mistreated by the manufacturer because the commands from somebody else have to go through the manufacturer's server. And that means the manufacturer knows what the commands are and when, probably knows who's sending those commands because that somebody has to have an account and knows what the what happens in response because any any output from the device goes to the manufacturer too and the toy was designed with a thermometer why do you want a thermometer in a sex toy well the users the human users don't it makes no difference to them but the manufacturer can use that to tell whether the product is in contact with a human body. And that is interesting for the manufacturer to know because it's profile type information that it can sell to some other company to figure out how to manipulate people uh, in a totally non-sexual but sleazy and disgusting way. Uh, so. The point is, if it can talk to the internet, it's been designed to subjugate you, spy on you, profile you, and manipulate you, and control you. And uh, I don't use things like that. So the, com the computers I will use are old models, because uh, around 10 to 15 years ago, Intel started designing all its processors to have a separate backdoor processor, a hardware backdoor, which is called the management engine. And it can talk to, uh, on the internet, to Intel and maybe various other organizations, even when, as far as you're concerned, your computer is not running. And uh, starting uh, a couple of years later, Intel's processors of a, a further generation couldn't even start up without having the management engine running. And those are the ones I won't run. If we can't switch off the management engine, then I consider it malicious. So I'm not looking for old technology for the kinds of reasons that you brought up. For instance, you talked about these different generations of oscilloscope. The feature that makes it work badly in the case you tested is a feature that was actually designed to be convenient for the user in some other case. Well, it wasn't designed to be malicious. No, the new was, oscilloscopes are very malicious. Maybe they are, but I didn't say they're not. I said the feature that, that you described, that one doesn't sound malicious as far as I can tell, but it was harmful to the thing you tried to do with it. So that I want to make that distinction. One is, it's a new feature, but it's a DWIM-like feature, do what I mean rather than do what I say. And it can be inconvenient when your case is not like the case it's designed to be helpful in. Basically, it's like a busybody. I know what you really need, and I'm going to give it to you whether you want it or not, and I won't let you stop it. Uh, well, that could be annoying as hell, but I'm talking about something that goes beyond that, something that is designed to stop you from doing things. And that's what the mandatory management engine is. It's the computer that you can't fully control. And no one has been able to figure out a way to get full control over those newer Intel processors. Intel always has control over them uh, if, if they're on the internet. And you may be able to block them off from the internet, but you can't get full control over that computer no matter what you do. Something as, fu as fundamental as test equipment is, is, has actually become quite nasty. Like mm. a lot of the oscilloscopes, you buy extra bandwidth if you want to get extra bandwidth you you buy a key to unlock that capability uh -huh. all the oscilloscopes have full have more bandwidth in them but you only pay for the bandwidth you use you get a license to unlock certain features of it uh -huh. so again and also if you're collecting data 
how do we know that the oscilloscope isn't spying on us and revealing our measurement data and trade secrets back to... We're eating by band, bandwidth in the case of an oscilloscope. So I don't use oscilloscopes. Well, je measuring and test instruments in general, like Keysight is one of the technologies. Uh, they've got this multimeter here. But how do I know that the multimeter isn't spying on me and sending well, back... Well, I have a multimeter, and I know it's not spying on me because it has no connection to anything except that I can look at the needle on it. Okay, but now they have licensed servers to unlock certain features. Uh, well, mine, mine is a very simple one. It has no internet communication, and therefore I know it's not doing that. But I agree with you. If something demands to talk to the internet, and get permission for you to do something that's malicious. Uh, and one interesting thing about free software is with free software, we can turn off malicious features. And as a result, free software normally doesn't have malicious features because anyone inclined to make a product malicious knows that it would be that Please. scheme to hurt us would be a failure if we could turn it off. Don't do that. Yeah, Kevin, maybe you can speak to that idea of of, of free code or free sourced. Uh, free software say, is what I call it. I had a, a friend I yesterday. I don't like the word software, but but I, I sort of but I like your word freedom. I like freedom. I I don't like open source because that's clearly Eric Raymond. See, and I think I try to draw lines of comparison to what I see in agriculture, what John Deere's doing, and everybody else follows John Deere, so I just watch John Deere, can't watch everybody. Yeah. I had a friend call me up, and he had to pay $7,000 for an unlock fee, so that's 20 numbers that you type into the display so you can unlock a feature like what you're talking about. Here, oscilloscope. This is a 15-year-old yeah. display. It runs on Windows CE, which is obsolete, and there's no security in it. And he's out $7,000 because there's no competition at all. And the awareness and how important it is to un unlock all this proprietary software that is 99% of what's run in agriculture right now. And it's run off a cliff of, of we're going to have an unbridled monopoly. And it's going to be like those banks in 2008 in Wall Street. They're too big to fail. We're going to be basically at a point where John Ear will get up in front of Congress and say, we're too big for you to mess with us anymore. We're too big with monopoly. And it's not too late. And uh, I hear what you're <clears> saying, <throat> and all I want to do is try to support you with what is going on with the food chain from the farm gate to the uh, grocery store, and we'll let you know how vulnerable that is at this point. I mean, you, you've got, you got uh, companies that now can't even offer contracts. Uh, Adolf Coors is doing that out in Colorado unless the farmer has a, a proprietary, uh, non-free subscription to the John Deere Operations Center, which is like the Amazon Cloud or like your Google Cloud account, except you have a reasonable expectation that that data is secure, which you know it's not, but most people think it is. Well, anyway, with John Deere, they come right out and say they're gonna take your data and ship it outside the United States jurisdiction. It's in the small print that nobody reads. And they're, they're getting the trade secret of every farm and every farmer. And uh, they're using the markets against them. So that's why when you talk about getting free code into agriculture, um, you know, I, I have a, a, an idea. And uh, I'll put it in the chat here when I get done talking. But it basically helps visualize how this could happen. And it's a, it's a free source program that you folks would easily understand how it's working and the beauty of it is it takes the firmware that's already in these tractors that have been sold the last 15 20 years it wipes the proprietary software off and it puts your own software on just like linux okay uh, and you mean you the GNU system, system. The GNU you're system. probably talking about the gnu operating system most people yeah. call that linux but if hey, if you'd if like you can to do get some of the credit too, software too. with GNU, great. That's what we have to do. And remember, these license displays to the uh, under the about section, they have GPL code on. 
but they're not giving us any help as far as the source code or anything else. And that's what my well, then they're violating the GPL. Now, you it, whether the copyright holders wish to enforce it, who they are, I don't know, but I suspect strongly that they're if they won't give you the source code, if they're distributing a binary of a program covered by the GNU General Public License, which is its full name, and they are not giving you an explicit written offer for the corresponding source code, that is a violation of the license unless it's copyright infringement. Now, copyright is mainly used to mistreat people, to keep people helpless and divided. But we have found this way, which we call copyleft, to turn it against those who would divide and control us. And that's what the GNU general public license is for. I wrote that license so that I and others could put it on our programs. And thus, we could use copyright to respect all users' freedom to cooperate with each other and to change the software for themselves and to share, but make it copyright infringement to distribute a non-free version of that software. So if, uh, say, uh, John Deere or Microsoft, hypothetically, or anyone were to take a copy of a piece of my software, originally it was mine, the GNU compiler collection when I wrote the first version, if they were to make changes and then, or even without changes, distribute binaries to somebody without source code or without the license or some basically in any way try to use that code to exercise power over other people, they would be infringing my copyright in the process. And although it's not as easy as falling off a log, legally I could stop them. Yeah. That's the idea of copyleft. It's using that law that they normally keep making nastier and nastier to restrict everybody and have power, I found a way to use it so that nobody could have power over anybody else, but everybody was guaranteed freedom. One thing is if you, if you think of it like a number line, I, I was explaining to people this idea that you've got copyright on the on the right hand side of the number line and then zero is the complete abolishment of copyright and copy left is on the other side of the number line you can you could say i used to think that the complete abolishment of copyright was an extreme position but now uh, with copy left uh, i would say that cop the complete abolishment of copyright is the central the centrist politically neutral position and then you've got on the right side, copyright, and on the left side, copy left. And yeah. that puts it into a more natural perspective, say that if you're in favor of copyright, you're a right-wing uh, edge case. The natural neutral position is to abolish copyright entirely. And now we can argue about whether we want to go to the left or right of that centrist position. Well, it's centrist in the same, just, just a moment, Kevin, it's centrist in the same way that centrist politicians are, 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 namely, they're actually corporatists, they're plutocratists. They advocate, you know, giving an even playing field between an individual and a billion dollar corporation. And of course, that's rigged so that the billion dollar corporation wins, breaks unions, uh, pays little, uh, screws people. And that's why that's not the position you should take if you want a world that's good for everybody. If you want a world that's good for everybody, that's a world in which the software we use, the software in our products, is free. Freedom yeah. respecting that means. Free software is a matter of freedom, not price. I have a question, Richard, uh, and you might be able to answer it very well. I was told by my professional software consultant that helps me in a lot of these projects to understand what we can do, that the software conservancy organizations are not equipped to take these uh, legal fights uh, to companies that are multi-billion, like John Deere. What he thought would be helpful would be to get the FTC to enforce the uh, GPL license. 
and or to enforce existing laws on the books that would comply, make make these companies comply with open source requests. Now we've sent John Deere, we've sent uh, other companies. For example, I'll give you a, a company named Ag Leader. They're probably the second uh, in the, they're probably the, the first or second independent provider of precision ag technology. They sell their own devices. And the devices look like they're running a form of Android, which is, they've even got GPL code in their about section and displays. And farmers spend $10,000 for these systems per tractor. And when we apply to get the code, which I'm just following what you just said, the code you wrote, okay, the, the seeding code for GPL, they refuse to give us any of the sort Well, of wait machine. a second, wait a second. I understand what you're saying, and it's certainly wrong, but, but there are legal aspects that are not clear that we don't know from the facts you described. For instance, we don't know who the authors are of the particular GPL-covered code that's in that product. You see, I wrote a license that any programmer can put on per own programs and release them as GPLs, but the one who can naturally enforce the GPL requirements if somebody violates the GPL. And remember, violating the GPL means denying some users the freedom that the GPL says they're entitled to. So a, a GPL violator is denying freedom for use of our code. But which ones is it? Is it mine? Is it his? Is it hers? Right? That's not automatically visible. Now, and as a result, you know, we would have trouble if, if the Free Software Foundation, for instance, had enough money to try this uh, with a big company, we still wouldn't know whether we could do it because we don't know what co program it is. Uh, if we knew, and if we knew it's a program that's copyright free Software Foundation, then we'd be legally entitled to do this. And we do raise this issue with companies and tell them, you can't do this, you've got to comply. And we generally get them to comply because they're not billion dollar companies. And even, even when they are, they might decide that they really should comply because they know that they're in the wrong. If, unless it's tremendously important to the company to keep violating the GPL, they'll probably make an arrangement and comply because it won't kill them. Uh, so that's what that's how our GPL enforcement normally works. But we do that with programs that are copyright free software foundation. And that's why are they copyright free software foundation? Because the human authors assigned the copyright so that we would be able to do this. If, if the copyright holder is someone else, then legally we have no we're not involved in the issue. Yes, there's a violation, but it's not against us. So why would the court pay attention to us? Well, maybe some courts will. That's an interesting question. Uh, you know, is who is entitled to enforce the GPL when it's violated? Can other users enforce it who are being denied the rights that they're supposed to be granted? Or is it only the author? You see, with copyright in the the classical way of thinking about copyright is that it's for the author. And, you know, mere readers and listeners don't matter. It's only the author that matters. But there's an idea that with copyleft, uh, it's for, since it is for the sake of every user's freedom, maybe the user should be able to go to court to enforce granting them the freedoms that the license says they're entitled to. And if that gets going, then users could get together, pool funds, and start going after more powerful companies and make them, making them obey the licenses. And I'd be, I'd be very glad to see that happen to this ag leader company, although I don't know anything about that case myself, but, but you do. Uh, the point is that just because they're violating the license on apparently on some GPL covered pro co programs, which ones we don't know, uh, then it, that doesn't immediately put us in the position where we can enforce it. Yeah, I think our letter was uh, more of a question on, you know, 
not an accusation. I don't want to come right out and accuse them of doing anything illegal. But on the other hand, we haven't heard back yet. So mm. and it's been over a year, I believe. It's way past the normal time of asking. And the same thing with John Deere. We, we've asked for their source code on various things. What we've got was incomplete libraries um, that were basically a waste of time. Well, no, that's certainly not sufficient to satisfy requirements of the GNU GPL, which say they have to distribute the complete corresponding source code of the program in question. I thought about this. I saw at the beginning that uh, this kind of evasion would be possible, and so I wrote that thing not to leave any loophole for that kind of mistreatment. <clears throat> so I should say, you are doing a great job in fighting, even though it's still at the beginning, in fighting John Deere. Because when John Deere makes a tractor, you build a detractor. Well, what we need to do, uh, I, I put a link on there, savannah.ag, and I really respect the, the guy with that technology. His name's Craig Rupp, and it's on the personal chat. And what, what I want to hear, this is more symbolic than anything else, but I want you guys to understand our world out here. You see this tractor? There's nobody driving. Yeah. Okay. What? There's nobody driving this tractor. Oh. And it's self driving tractor. Field. And that, that link on the public chat, you can pull the same thing up if you want to look at it on the internet. But what the, what the deal is here, what, what I, is a non computer coding guy, what I see here is that. It's proprietary software on a, a brand new machine. Okay, so that's two negatives. A farmer wants to use what he has right now. So the mechanism that interfaces the robotic nature of this equipment system is a technology that we should have available and, and be have competition. Because right now the OEMs are going to control this. They're going to lock it down with the firmware that's installed on the tractors. We need to have a awareness that there's a huge opportunity out here in robotics because that's where things are moving like Wayne Gretzky was a hockey player he never skated where the hockey puck was he skated where it was going to be okay that picture and that link I just sent you is where the future of ag will be a future of food production go ahead Richard well I would like to move from the topic of agriculture to a, a topic that affects everybody's life directly uh, agriculture is crucial, but most of us are not in that field. Uh, but everybody is a potential victim of surveillance. And one of the reasons I am very worried about uh, driverless vehicles, I don't call them autonomous because most they may not be autonomous. They may be constantly connected and sending data to somebody and they need to have cameras because the vehicle needs to see where people are so it won't hit them. That's absolutely necessary. But if it sees where people are with cameras and it sends all that data to somebody, that can probably be used to recognize those people. Imagine if every uh, driverless vehicle going on the street is surrounded by cameras that can recognize you and any passers by and sends that data to a company that could just just as well do facial recognition on all that and track everybody. Now, if you, in a country where facial recognition is used to track everybody, well, that's China. It's a horrible repressive tyranny facilitated by keeping track of where everybody goes and what everybody buys because uh, typically you can't pay with cash anymore. Everybody, everything is being tracked. Who talks with whom is being tracked. And this is the basis of total tyranny. So one of the reasons I reject a lot of kinds of technology is this. Uh, we need to be able to prevent massive surveillance. And this is why I uh, admire Edward Snowden, why I've often given him three cheers, because 
he's a hero in fighting to save us from becoming China. Now, uh, driverless vehicles are one kind of system that threatens to surveil us. Of course, it's not the only one. Put enough cameras around the streets and they can recognize and track everybody. Uh, and that has to be forbidden. It should be illegal for any organization to systematically collect videos and uh, such that they can be scanned with facial recognition. Not only government agencies, not only cops, but any company, anyone to systematically do this should be criminal. Well, what, what, what I think happens is there's surveillance in the driverless vehicles, but then, of course, smart cities have all kinds of surveillance built into them as well. I'll I know. Well, we have to forbid that. We have to make sure that those systems can only measure the things we want them to measure and cannot identify individuals. You can design systems that can monitor the things that a city needs to monitor, which are not about individuals, but you know, about the way systems are functioning, where there's a problem, where there's not a problem, and make only that kind of information available so that problems that are beyond one person can be found and dealt with, and yet at the same time, individuals are not tracked. By the way, this is uh, one of the main, surveillance is the main reason I refuse to have a portable phone. Yeah, that's that's it. that's interesting, because surveillance is built into nearly everything, and how do you trust and verify? Trust but verify. As well, because it, my way is don't allow it to communicate. If a pro, you know, there I have computerized things that have some kind of microprocessor in them, in my home but they have no communication with anyone, so I know they can't be surveilling me. If they were talking to the internet, then I couldn't trust them. But the newer technologies are all requiring to connect. I won't get, I won't use any of those. Those are unjust. That's what we have to do. Now, if you can stop it from connecting to the internet, like if it wants to talk to Wi-Fi, you can stop it by never letting it connect to your Wi-Fi. Uh, and, of course, the people living nearby you, probably they have different uh, passphrases, which you don't know. So, and the device won't be able, the product won't be able to connect to those Wi-Fi's either. Uh, that drive? makes it safe. Do, do you drive? Do you have a car? I have a driver's license. I do not own a car. But I suspect it's possible to disconnect a connected car to make it a, a trustworthy disconnected car by disconnecting the antennas. That's the crucial thing. Uh, the antenna that enables it to be, quote, connected, unquote, that's got to be disconnected. It's probably on screws, and if not, you could probably wrap aluminum foil around it, making it unable to succeed in radio communication. This is something that would be interesting to test. Uh, the other thing is, if there's a GPS antenna, well, if it records where you've been, then whenever it's serviced, it could upload all that information. Uh, the laws that are currently being designed to help people get some data out of their cars in order to repair them, well, that's a good thing to do. I support right to repair, but the right to repair advocates mostly don't recognize that this is just a part of a broader issue it should be illegal for a car to store information about where it has been or any data from which that can be calculated, for instance, by dead reckoning. If it records the speed and direction all the time, then from that it would be possible to calculate later where the car has been. So it should be illegal to store that information in the absence of a search warrant, of course. We do need the state to investigate crimes. But if you allow search warrants, in other words, if you allow conditional privacy, that is to say, maybe if you say that's like the clipper chip, you know, we're going to say we have surveillance that's allowed under court order, then it opens the door to surveillance. 
The difference, yes, but the, the difference between search warrants as they have traditionally operated and the clipper chip is that a search warrant means they're allowed to start collecting data. If you collect data on everyone all the time and then look at it when the state says, let's look, uh, that is tyranny. That's going too far. We ha that's why I say we must insist that the systems that are installed in the world not collect and save data. When there's a reason to track some individual or some group or whatever, then that justifies installing things to track and observe and listen to those people. But the law must not permit having those systems pre-installed to track everyone, listen to everyone, and so on, uh, in case there becomes a valid reason to look at what that person has been doing all per life. And this is why the Snowden revelations were so important, because Snowden showed that our so-called national security apparatus was doing exactly that. And of course, we don't have any security as a people if we're all being surveilled, if data about us is being collected all the time. Now, in the US, many products do this all the time. Uh, I spoke with somebody who, was, who lived in a rural place, mostly rural-ish place in, in California. It was a it may, be, it may have been a subdivision with few entries. Uh, and so they were interested in installing a, a security, a video security system that would watch and make recordings. But they found out that the, the systems that were on offer would all transmit this data to somebody else. And once the system does that, it's no longer a security camera, it's now a surveillance system. And those should be illegal. It should be illegal to set up a system that will transmit the video all the time to any other place. But to have a security camera which will make recordings, which will get overwritten after a couple of weeks, that should be okay because that is tolerable in regard to surveillance. If, because, and the reason is that the amount of work involved in collecting all those recordings and reading them would be so much that it will only be done when there is a crime of specific reason to make it worthwhile. And it's having a it being surveilled so rarely is something we can live with for the sake of catching those criminals. But we, what we must not allow is to collect data about us all the time, because that's basically like a, a, an, an attractive nuisance saying, come grab this data and surveil everyone all the time. That we must yeah, the, not is vulnerability we must not allow. The the trend is towards uh, cloud based surveillance. That's just the way the technology is evolving. In fact, a lot of people are buying into that. A lot of people are buying home cameras that are cloud based, and then they're monitoring the streets. So what you get is a situation where just about everywhere in the city is is monitored in the cloud. Well, I don't use the term cloud because. Here's why. There's a question that word is designed to convince you not to ask. Whose computer is this data in? Who's monitoring me? Who's monitoring us? Uh, there is no cloud, is one of our slogans. Only other people's computers. But if you think of it as a cloud, you're telling yourself all the time, it doesn't matter whose computer. And it matters tremendously who is computer. And so I'm saying, let's get rid of the concept of cloud and let's prohibit systems which send data remotely if they don't tell you exactly where. Because that will make it a lot harder to get permission to send the data someplace else at all. And that way, there will be less surveillance. Again. I think of this as being connected with what Snowden taught us. So I don't engage in uh, uncontrolled internet communication unless I have some reason to, to, that is the other side is uncontrolled 
unless I have some reason to know it can't identify me, can't track me. Usually that reason is the Tor network, plus refusing to run the software that the site sends to my browser. My browser is set up to refuse to run it. A lot, often that software is designed to surveil people, identify people, even if you don't give your name. It, if sites cooperate, uh, in surveilling people, it can be lots of different sites cooperating, and if any one of them figures out something about you, including perhaps your name, uh, then they all get to recognize you if you show up. But none of them can recognize me because my browser won't run that software. Kevin. I have a quick interjection, and you probably know this, but it's the most unbelievable thing that happens on a regular basis uh, let's say a farm comes up for sale and this particular banker that I talked to told me they buy his data <laughs> they don't believe it so they geofence him and they get the information from where he's going so like if this property comes up for sale they want to know if there's competing banks and if he walks into the competing bank they get a buzzer that goes off so Think about that for a minute. What, it's well, how are they doing that? Through his portable phone? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I don't have a portable phone, and this is why. Well, because it's a surveillance right. system. Yeah, you're right. Because I that. <laughs> okay, that doesn't make the internet. You can't just Google it and find out how to buy somebody's data. But these high-end banks are doing that, and so I just find it unbelievable. There's there's no privacy out here, and. It's, no, well, we can bring it back if we start demanding laws to prohibit tracking people. The, that the, all the laws proposed to supposedly protect our privacy are fundamentally inadequate because they are focused on data protection. The idea is the data has been collected by somebody, and it is a matter of limiting legally how that data can be used or provided to others. Well, that's, the law. that's too late. The time that we have to act to protect privacy for real is to prohibit the collection of the data. It is making the database that attacks privacy. Once the data are collected, they will be misused. Yeah, so we've got about five, we're, we're at the 55 minute mark. If we want this to fit inside a one hour slot, we, we got, another five minutes to sort of do you think it has to be just a one hour slot or could it be an hour and a half you got three interesting people here talking about important things yeah 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 it's definitely a very important thing if it's too long it, it'll be tough to fit in anywhere but um, well it's your event so it's really your decision you could obviously Cut it here. Yeah, yeah. I think, like, let's take another five minutes and 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 kind of converge on something. And I think what I'm seeing, Richard, what you're talking a lot about is law, using law to stop this. But I also, uh, you know, that we could say the laws are shepherd. We <coughs> law. Law. I don't say that, but law, law can be <coughs> law in the hands of a democratic government with people who understand the dangers of computing misused, can use laws to limit what big companies can do. And we can't do that by developing our own technology, because the big companies can use the technology they want to use. Yeah. You know, okay. If a big company wants to put cameras all around the street and collect the data, we can't stop that by developing different technology, but we may be able to stop that by laws. Yeah, so it sounds like we're on a defensive side where we're just trying to put brakes on existing yep. technology. We, there's a tremendous amount of bad, evil technology that potentially, and already beginning, uh, harms our freedom terribly. And if we want to win back the privacy and in some cases freedom that we used to have we may have to go on the offensive against technology that has done harm to us already but it had it may require a legal offensive 
a technical offensive may just not do the job. So technical then, offensive can give us back control of our own computers. Where do our skills come? We're, we're scientists, engineers, physicists, people like that. Should we all go to Harvard Law School? You know, surely there must be a-, a I didn't say that. There's language. plenty for us to do, but some things don't assume, you seem to be trying to go to the opposite extreme, that we should do everything by developing technology. And I'm saying that there's some harms, some threats that we can't address that way. But there's plenty to do. You know, developing computers that can make a laptop which doesn't have anything like the management engine, that's work to be done. And there's plenty more. You know, interfacing to these freedom respecting laptops are the products that are being made to talk to a portable phone, to a Snoop phone, uh, products doing life saving or extremely useful things that a person who wants freedom has to decline unless we develop a new ways to interface them to freedom respecting computers. Kevin, maybe you want to wrap up here. Real, real quickly, uh, and I'm not just pounding on agriculture, this is for any device, uh, and I'm taking inspiration from you, Richard, on what you're talking about with the, the legal concept, but on the technical side as well. This is in your guys' wheelhouse to see how this works. This GitHub, it's called OpenWRT. That's, that takes no permission from the OEM. You don't need their, their advice, you don't need their help, you don't need their permission. You wipe their software off the devices that you own, and you put your own system on there, and then you can have your own security design from the bottom up. Yes. By the way, there is also a there's also a program Libra WRT, which I think Thank is you. more strictly freedom respecting than Open WRT. I think it's a modified version of Open WRT, but to fit the follow the rules of free software's respect for users' freedom. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyway, yes, that's a good, what, as I understand it, that's something you could put into a Wi-Fi hub if it is compatible with that. And I've got a Wi-Fi hub that, uh, that has Libra WRT in it. Uh, but uh, there are a lot more things like that that we need programmers to develop, and there are a lot more pieces of hardware we need people to Replace, make replacements for so that they can run without any non-free software. If you want to learn more about this, please look at GNU.org. That's G-N-U.org. Uh, it started out as the website for the GNU operating system. Most people are somewhat confused and they think that that system is Linux. Well, it's used with Linux. Uh, Linux is the kernel and the rest of the system is basically GNU plus a lot of other things. But uh, look there and it'll, you'll also find in GNU.org slash philosophy, the philosophical ideas of the free software movement and in GNU.org slash malware, you'll find out about hundreds of examples of malicious non-free programs. That is, it's not just that they're nasty in some way, they were designed specifically to mistreat their users. Yeah, that yeah. would be malice inside or tyranny inside by design. Yes, so, I mean, there's a big difference between a product is unpleasant, nasty, uncooperative on the one hand, and on the other, it's malicious. Malicious is much worse, and I wouldn't use that term for a product which merely has a bad, inconvenient design and so on. Uh, yeah. Anybody can do that. That's, mm -hmm. that's, you know, even people trying to do the best they can can do that. I can do that. I would never make something malicious, but I might do a bad job. Yeah, it something. seems like just about almost everything now has some malice in it, even just from the in access to the source or the, the ability to understand, you know. And the I make a distinction. You know, if, this, if there's non-free software in something, that's an injustice. But when I say that the software is malicious, that is a distinction. Um, malicious means there is a functionality that was designed specifically to hurt the user. So not every non-free program is malicious, but nowadays it's more and more common that they are malicious. 
Anyway, in addition to GNU.org, take a look at FSF.org. That's the initials of the Free Software Foundation. And the Free Software Foundation is an organization I started to promote and defend and facilitate the use of free software. Okay, and so we'll it needs we'll more members and it needs, it runs on donations. It's a tax exempt charity and it needs your support now. Excellent. So I'll make links to that material. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for coming together for this important talk. If I may, I'd like to mention one more website, stolman.org. That's my personal website where I post other sorts of things, my writing, my puns, and political notes about issues other than free software. Excellent. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so we'll put those in the, in the description. Send me any other links that you have and we'll put them in the description. Cool. Okay, well that was fun. Yeah. It was. I have a feeling we could have gone on for half an hour more saying interesting, pertinent things. But that's why. We could probably talk all day, you know, about even the concept of aletheia and openness. Like, to my way of thinking... I don't use the term openness. I avoid it. Okay. Because that's the rival for mind share of yeah, freer yeah. Libra. I would want people to think about, does this respect my freedom? You know, you at the beginning, you mentioned, can, can you see the source code? But that's not enough. That's just the beginning of respecting the user's freedom. Users have to be free to change it and run the modified version and then distribute that to others. People have to be free to give away copies and sell copies. And then you get free software. Free software is a lot more than just being able to look at the source code. Just yeah. being able to look at it, well, that doesn't mean you could install a modified version if you make one. Nowadays, yeah. there are computers. In fact, a lot of PCs are designed so that you can't install a modified version even if you make a modified version. And that is not freedom. So this is one of the reasons I have don't use the word open to talk about this issue. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank, thank you to both of you. And uh, I'll uh, look forward to posting soon. Happy hacking. Yep. Yes. Bye.